Hey everyone, uh, thank you for tuning in to today's webinar. I'm David Adler, the chairman and founder of BizBash, and I'm thrilled to introduce today's presenter, Jen Bendorf and Christine Martin of GES Events. Jen is head of North American New Business Development and Global Strategy at GES. She brings more than 25 years of business development, client experience, event marketing strategy, and holistic brand experience design to her role. Her favorite quote is, pressure is a privilege. Champions Adjust from Billie Jean King, and hasn't this been the year for adjusting? Christine is the executive director of GES Events, uh, Emma, uh, E-M-E-A. -E -E she is an experienced senior leader in both the publishing and events industry and a strategic thought leader who collaborates with clients and industry partners to reinvent the industry. Christine's favorite quote is, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Peter Drucker, one of my favorite quotes. Today, Jen and Christine will share how to embrace the chaos and reinvent your live experiences in an upside down world. Uh, but before we get started, we have a few housekeeping uh, details. Uh, we wanna make sure that you share your webinar feedback with the hashtag, hashtag smarter events and tag BizBash and GES Global. We will be hosting a Q&A at the end of the webinar. So please submit your questions via the Q&A button uh, in your toolbar. At the conclusion of the webinar, we're gonna be sending out a copy of the recording so you can check back and you don't even have to take notes. Next Tuesday, December 8th, we're dropping a special three-part Gather Geeks podcast series from BizBash and GES called It's a Hybrid World. Think of it as a Netflix series. You can binge, listen all at once or go through them at your own pace. You will receive a link to, this, uh, to the episodes in a follow-up email. So without further ado, let me introduce Jen and Christine. That's great. Thank you, David. Now, I think we appreciate, don't we, Jen, that our, our title here is pretty bold, but I guess that is the point because we've had quite the year. And um, as event professionals, I guess our instincts, our training, our entire careers are predicated on being fantastic, meticulous planners. Um, and I think one of the challenges we've had is how do we manage the unpredictable when um, our instincts, as I say, is to plan within an inch of our lives? So we've heard from clients um, on both sides of the pond, in fact, all over the globe, pretty much the same pain point, which is that juggling so many variables um, from regional lockdowns to travel, international travel regulations to should you wear a mask? I think we, uh, I think we have Freeze. some technical difficulties going on with uh, Jen's feed, or sorry, Christine's feed. Um, Jen, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll just pick up. I mean, this is real life, right? This is predicting the un the uncontrollable. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, you know, we're we're in the process of constant studying trends and insights from what's happening out there, and. And as much as we would love to predict, you know, when we'll all be able to come back in person, the one thing that we're doing in um, scenario planning with our clients is using macro trends and consumer behavior, um, looking at attendee mindset. So really going deep into understanding um, your attendees needs, interests, and wants for both virtual and hybrid experiences. And then really working on um, moving into 2021, we're seeing a lot of our clients want to start to dig in deep with us now and predict options of how can we um, do surveys, do design experiences um, for both the virtual and hybrid type event experiences that are gonna have a high impact and be very attractive for your events. So moving forward, um, you know, again, experiences are brand builders and it's all about reaching the heart and minds of your attendees. And we really believe that, you know, this is a critical stage. It's, I mean, it's an exciting time to be in the event industry. There's been a lot of pain points we've all gone through, but we're starting to see things turn around. And, um, you know, we've actually done a lot of research um, constantly. In fact, this past summer, we actually surveyed attendees from large show um, trade shows. And 
And this um, X to Y axis here, these five segments that popped up are something that we're continuing to see. And, and I challenge you guys to even think about who, who are your friends and family members and neighbors, and they probably fall into these five categories as well in terms of their appetite to dine out or you know go outside and do activities. But from um, the, the um, research we did, um, about 1,300 attendees kind of fell into the, nope, I'm not interested at all in going to a live event, all the way over to the far right-hand side of what virus, I'm there in a heartbeat. And then there's folks in the middle here. And I think the key message here is that as we're designing um, events moving forward, especially for hybrid, is we have to realize that not all attendees are the same and everybody has different different appetite for risks. Um, so, you know, of course, it's all about us staying connected safely. And um, as we're designing what hybrid looks like, this is at the forefront. So um, looking at the entire experience, touch points from the minute they arrive on, on site to when they depart is really, really just um, using processes and um, our team at GES events is, is really um, making sure that we are, we are including an events health and safety coordinator who has the latest um, guidelines, best practices, and we're even proactively setting standards for our event experiences of how to help staff, partners, sponsors, attendees feel safe and comfortable attending in person. So let's transition to hybrid events and a lot of the planning that we're doing. We're gonna give you some, some interesting things here, but actually before we dive into this, um, we wanted to make this presentation interactive. So um, Haley, I'm gonna lean on you here, but we have a, our first polling question that we'd like to pop up. So Christine was talking about the latest news. I'm sure all of you have heard this is, is um, does the announcement around vaccines make you more confident in running a hybrid event? We'd love to use this as an opportunity to kind of get a sense of the sentiment out there. I'll give you a few more minutes as you're, you're selecting yes, no, or maybe. Looks like a um, good percentage of you are saying yes with a little bit of maybes in there. And I think this is very analogous to, you know, predicting the uncontrollable, which Christine has jumped right back in perfectly on cue. So as I said, this is real world happens and we pivot. Okay, good. So thank you everyone for participating in that. We'll have another fun polling question for you in a little bit here. So as we transition um, with our clients and conduct scenario planning, you know, our strategic point of view is that hybrid events are not two um, separate events, online and in person. It really is blending the in-person attendee journey with the online user experience to deliver the most high impact emotional event experience for your audience. And, you know, this is something that we were talking about pre COVID. I think everybody, all of us, were saying, yes, we have to work in a digital experience into our event. Well, COVID, you know, the positive is, is, is that digital is first and foremost now. And, you know, the, uh, the uh, genie is out of the bottle. I really don't think that we're gonna go back to any event models that are pre-COVID, you know, 2019. From this point forward, and we're hearing it from our clients, is, is they, are, they are saying there's always gonna be a digital component and we believe in that too. Um, and in fact, I would hypothesize that moving forward, we even drop the term hybrid from our vernacular. It's events and it happens to be offered online and in person. So um, let's face it, humans are social creatures and we will always find a way. Um, we have seen this and so many innovative examples you know, since March. Um, I'm sure you all have your amazing examples, you know, from virtual wine tasting to virtual Peloton challenges, 
business people jumping on and playing um, Grand Theft Auto in the evenings, but also talking about business during the time of COVID. Um, and my favorite, because I am a tennis fanatic, is Andy Murray and his wife threw down the hammer out to the ATP um, pros, as well as anyone and everyone that wanted to give a shot. Um, it was the 100 volley challenge. If you, if you didn't participate in it, anyone can do it. If you get two rackets and a partner in your backyard, um, my daughter and I tried it, honestly, and we got, I think, until about 19 hits and then fell down laughing on the ground. But the point here is, is just there, there has been so many lessons learned in the power of humans connecting um, and, and trying to build communities, even when the in-person has been taken away from us. So I think when we come back to in-person, you know, people, people are just going to be really um, thriving and gravitating and enjoying the socialization aspect. Um, so, you know, as we are scenario planning with our clients, we are looking at um, embracing attendees mindsets and we are constantly listening for cues, for pain points, for interests, for, for what they're saying. You know, we're, we, we, we've heard that clients have said while they've surprisingly found great value in attending online, they miss those hallway conversations in person because that's where they were getting some of the most valuable nuggets and time spent. Um, but on the flip side, they've been surprised at how valuable the virtual events have been in allowing them to upskill and um, maybe recertify, maybe go deeper into business skills. So that's been very positive. Um, there obviously, I think all of us are eager to get back in person for networking, for connecting, from learning from each other. Um, but you know, another little nugget, a pain point has been that um, clients have shared with us, you know, it's it can be frustrating. We're living so much um, online with emails that the email volume has increased so much that when you when you do want to attend that live event, gosh, I wish I could find that link, you know. So I know that didn't happen today because the reminders were coming in, and Biz Biz, Biz Bash has good um, practices in that area. So. Let's shift and I'll bring Christine back in on this. We're going to take you through our top seven tips for event planning in 2021. So here's the irony. The, um, the first tip is no apologies necessary, even though I should apologize for my Wi-Fi having not been, um, having not been sustained throughout that, that presentation. So thank you, Jen, for picking up. That's why we did a two-hander, obviously. So um, no apologies necessary. What do, what do we mean by this? Well, um, we have seen, and in all honesty, we have also done it ourselves, um, so many event organizers and brand owners um, announced the shift to digital with an apology, with a downbeat apology. And um, I'm embarrassed because I can feel myself kind of, you know, having said this as well, which is the kind of, oh no, it's so terrible. We can't run our event. It's going to have to be virtual. And um, we think that as we approach 2021, we should look at that differently and we should be proud of what virtual brings to the hybrid experience. So I think our first thing um, really take away is to be proud about your event experience and know that the virtual piece will actually add value to the face-to-face -face piece. And so the two should be working um, in concert together as two sides of the same coin. So no apologies necessary when you announce your next event, whether it's virtual, whether it's hybrid, whether it's face-to-face, -face, um, don't do it with a, with a kind of a, a, a downward smiley face. Do it with pride because you should be delivering a great event, whichever platform it is. Um, and so, yeah, no apologies necessary. Number two, create marquee moments online and in person. And this is where we're ideating and, and really having fun getting very creative with clients as we're scenario planning for both virtual and hybrid events in 2021. Because, you know, there is this thing called Zoom fatigue out there. And um, so, so even more um, pressure and need to look at creating strong reasons and give people a reason why they should log in for your online virtual event, why, why, why they should clear their calendar and attend in person. So we're looking at things um, in an innovative way, like offering a VIP viewing room for those that are attending in person. And perhaps, you know, instead of the negative, 
overflow room. Maybe it's from a positive perspective of VIP space where they have access to keynote speakers ap after they come off the stage from delivering their in-person event. Or um, for the digital um, attendees, maybe they have access to a behind the scenes tour of a research and development center um, or, a, or a key experience that that not only they are able to have an exclusive access to real time during your event, but this is content that can live after um, because we really are seeing events as something that that is not a one and done in a, in, in, in a finite time and space, but something that can extend and keep the conversation going with your customers. So our next tip is that we should make it feel live even if it's not. Um, and I think we all know that video on demand, again, has been a, a fantastic asset that we've been able to use extensively, that we've actually extended the life of our events with video on demand. But actually, the live experience, as we keep coming back to, is unmatchable. And so if you can add either real live or simulive, as we've been calling it, that will actually change your the nature of your event and, and its appeal and, its, and the engagement you receive. And our quick, um, our quick case study here is outside of our industry. And actually this is the LA Times Book Club. And as you can probably tell from my accent, um, that is not my local book club, but I think it is Jen's actually. And they've done a great thing, which is taking it virtual, going on to digital and bringing authors into people's homes. And obviously for any book club, if you're a book club fan, there is nothing like meeting your author. And if you ever go to any book events or book exhibitions, there are queues round, literally around the block for people to meet with their author. It is a real kind of fan experience. So this is a golden moment and they've used digital to be able to bring that fanzine moment into the lives of a, of a, a reader at home. And I think there's great learnings for us in that. Think about your event. How can you bring, it may be a celebrity that is in your industry celebrity. It may be an A-lister. It may, be, um, it may be your CEO, who knows, but try and get that live experience baked into your event because that will make it really special and improve your engagement along the way. And the cool thing just adding here is, even though I live in LA, as many of you know, it's a huge city. I, I was actually never able to attend in person. Now, now, now that it's virtual, it's reaching a broader audience. And I try not to miss this one because if I can get into a opportunity to chat with these top authors, how cool is that? So the learning there and how we can apply this, as Christine said, to the event industry is very powerful. So number four, we're looking at planning pre-event engagement so that you get your attendees to invest in showing up ahead of time and create more of those reasons why they need to really attend in person or online. And so what we're doing here is um, seeing opportunities to um, offer deep dive content, maybe start the upskilling um, start it pre-event through video on demand, through, through content on demand, so that during the live event days, you can keep the conversation going and go deeper into that, like we were just talking about, live Q&A, live roundtable discussions with smaller cohorts and allow people to have that um, connectivity that we're all missing. Um, and also, um, allowing people to customize their experience beforehand. So just getting even savvier, you know, whether attendees are, are coming in person or they're attending online to allow them to curate and kind of see in the agenda, how plan out their time better so that they can also have time for socializing um, and networking. So matching up people and allowing them to identify and share different interests and needs that they have and connecting people beforehand so that really the event starts well, well before the launch date. And I think this is one of my favorite visuals in our deck, actually. But I think we all know that content is king and we are not disputing that at all as we kind of give you our, our fifth hint and tip. But socializing or networking comes actually above content when we research our attendees again and again and again, no matter what the format is, um, it still comes up as the, as the reason that they value their, their investment of, of time and often money to come to your event. So um, our advice is, and we've again seen this, um, we've done it ourselves many times where we pack an agenda because we know content is so important and we pack it so tight 
um, and we fill it with great stuff. It's not about the fact that it's not great content, um, but we don't create often enough time for people to actually socialize and network with their peers. And um, this is, I think, a great picture. And it reminds me why I want to get back to live events, um, because it should be fun as well. And it talks to all those points you've made earlier about making great connections um, for both personal reasons, but also professional. And this is the water cooler moments, the hallway, the hallway kind of interactions. Um, if I dare say it, at the bar late at night, the people that you meet wrapped around the event uh, is, is crucial. And in digital environments, this is gonna be harder to achieve and make it feel as natural, but we're seeing lots of innovation around digital networking opportunities. Um, and I think it's really important when you think of your program to actually get your socializing, your networking actually baked in. And um, the more that you can promote that and make it happen, the more your attendees will thank you for it. You'll get better MPS or better survey scores at the end, trust us. So number six, reimagining how we gather. We are working with clients right now and, and using experience design to rethink um, how, how the footprint of the space is used for the in-person events. So um, everything from how the layout of the registration occurs, you know, if you're able to use use more outdoor space, allow people choices of how they are going to view and watch um, content, you know, keynote presentations instead of packing everybody into the uh, standard ballroom. Um, and especially with social distancing, you kind of need a little bit more options. So even having live streamed from different um, venue space in the property, so, so this is this is where it's bringing that design thinking and looking at the um, event space in, a, in an experiential way and and just getting really creative and you know in all honesty I think we we uh, probably can be honest with ourselves that pre COVID there were things about live events that probably needed an overhaul we were probably asking people to sit in their seats inside a ballroom for way too long. So, you know, also looking at content and use of space in smaller bite-sized pieces, because going back to what um, Christine was talking about and giving more of that socialization time, it's gonna be important for us to come back together and almost relearn how to network and interact. It's been a while. Um, and, you know, really to just make, make the in-person experience as welcoming as possible. Yes, and gamification, I'm, in the spirit of full disclosure, wasn't even a word when I went to school. But I think we all know what it is. And the learning and development and the education industries have been using gamification for years as a way of communicating, engaging, and getting across um, sometimes complex ideas and complex um, communication objectives. So we've seen gamification come into events an awful lot in the last, I would say, three to five years. And I think this is a trend that has just accelerated um, with digital and with hybrid events. So we are moving really to build that into our agendas right from the get-go, rather than as the add-on at the end when you can't think of anything else to do and just say, oh, let's throw in a game here. And I think we'll just see some of the, the kind of the visuals we've got coming up on the next slide is, um, yeah, thank you, Jen, is some of the, um, the ad advances we've seen really come into their own, which is, um, using AI to help with the networking that we talked about earlier, really helping develop micro communities at your event. So there will be matchmaking opportunities that you can do to make sure that people meet their like-minded soulmates within a professional environment um, at your event using gamification. Uber networking opportunities, and we've called it serendipitous digital encounters, ways that you can bring people those, I guess, water cooler or hallway movements or late night bar moments that you can actually create in a digital space. So there are an, an enormous amount of, um, of technical um, innovations that we've seen come on, onto the market. Um, I'm not gonna go into any of them here. You'll probably know many of them, but it's actually a great way to, to, to as you say, promote the socialization and the engagement of your audience. And then finally, we could not resist th throwing in a bonus tip here, but it's a reminder for all of us that are in the event industry that events have been and will be even more critical to business success and play a key part in your marketing mix because you know they really are a key part about driving brand awareness, delivering sales results, getting your products and services in front of your target customers, your partners, 
you know, providing valuable signals to the financial market, um, providing PR and, you know, bringing your, your customer fan base together and continuing to celebrate your unique communities. Um, but most importantly, it's about helping people connect. Um, and, and we can't understate this enough really. Um, but, but um, you know, the other, the other thing too that's important to think about is moving into 2021. Um, again, events are not gonna be just a one and done, you know, th across three days. If you really look at it as offering a continuous marketing campaign, that's the role that events are going to play in the entire marketing mix. And, and I think this is um, if, you know, those of you that embrace this are really going to help elevate and drive your business success and to think of it in that mindset versus a specific point in time. So um, let's pause here and let's kind of do a little another interaction. We kind of got out of order here and, but um, we wanted to pull, pull uh, throw up a polling question on um, pain points. So going back to attendee mindset, and you can answer this from your own perspective, but what are your top two pain points for planning events in 2021? Um, we have implementing new safety measures, finding the right platform for your virtual and hybrid event, attendee engagement, uh, finding new sponsorship opportunities for virtual and hybrid, and then effective networking opportunities. We were we were curious again to to gather uh, some some real time insights from you all. So it looks like attendee engagement is is popping up pretty high there, with networking opportunities as a second. Safety measures third, excellent. Good, thank you. Thank you for participating in that. So um, the other thing too that hybrid events and virtual events is really allowing us to do is there's, there's a huge opportunity for us to, to, to sharpen our tools in terms of data analytics. And um, you know, this is something that we've been, GES events has been diving into and studying quite a bit the effectiveness um, of virtual events and then applying that in the future as we're planning for hybrid events because we can now actually dive in and really see how um, attendee behavior is, you know, how people are spending their time, what, what are they, uh, um, watching, you know, on the virtual event? Are they attending the general session and going to breakouts? Which ones are popping up? Um, because then it's allowing us as we move forward with our clients to tune up and see how can we shift things and apply this learning, you know, for the hybrid experience. So um, we're looking at mapping events to business goals through, you know, is the content tailored to the attendees needs? Um, is, is the experience satisfying? Do the attendees feel supported? And is the attendance producing the desired business outcomes? So lots of opportunities there that we're digging into. So as we um, wrap up here, you know, just, just wanna share that, you know, for all of us, this is the time for us to, to have fun in the creative sandbox. Um, you know, it's never been a better time to be in the event industry because this is where we can we can really start to define the boundaries of what um, hybrid events will look like moving forward in a way that that is raising the bar and and offering event experience that are better than ever. So amplify what was working pre-COVID and fix the pain points from from events um, that we probably knew we had to address. So with that, we will, you know, thank you so much for joining us again. You know, it's that whole attendee journey plus user experience equals the ultimate event experience. So we'll open it up for Q&A. David, back Great. to you. Great. Thank you so much, guys. That was fantastic. Um, I wanted to, we, we have this great series that's about to come out on our podcast and some of the thing, questions I have are from that. We had a large conversation about content, how important content is. Bring content down to just the CEO of your company when he's actually getting on stage. That is content too. 
how do you rein them in and give them advice on creating content that people really will want to listen to and be engaged with? Yeah, you know, I think that's where as we partner with our clients and really try to better understand what, what, are, what are their business goals um, and how can we help them reach their audience? You know, I think so many times um, uh, pre-COVID, you know, the whole general session, everybody in the same ballroom was sort of designed for the CEO to deliver their message to everyone at the same time. Well, now it's about helping him or her look at what are the key messages and how can we be creative in leveraging the different platforms of online and virtual to reach an even broader audience and even look at that at her delivery of, okay, so this message is such that, um, you know, this is, this is ongoing content. So it's, again, I think it's sharing with her that it's not a one and done and there's gonna be opportunities to keep sending that message over and over, um, you know, and look at ways to, to even leverage when the CEO steps off the stage, you know, how can we continue developing cool content and behind the scenes? Cause I think we all now love it. People love seeing what's on the bookshelves. You know what I mean? It's on TV. People love seeing CEOs, um, folks that they haven't had access to from their homes and what's behind them, what's the environment. So keeping it real is key too. And do you think that it's the intimacy that you're creating by, by breaking Definitely. this wall that seems to be part of the new zeitgeist of what we're doing here in our business? Yeah, I mean, I really think, you know, before all of this, and we heard this from some of our clients back in March when we immediately had to start getting them to think about virtual, there was this huge like, oh my God, you gotta be kidding me, no one's gonna show up. Well, now, the veil, you know, the walls have been taken down and now we're seeing everybody as real humans in everyday life. And there's something um, very powerful and inspiring about that, that I think beforehand there was a lot of veneer. There was, there was, there was a lot of maybe even fakeness that was there that, that now is taken down. So now you're really getting to know people. Right. So both, for both of you, one of the big questions that seems to pop up is how do you activate networking both in the real world and in the virtual world it's a challenge it um, is. There's, there's but there's a lot there's still intimacy there too how do you guys uh, approach this problem and what have you seen that has worked yeah well you know it's um continues to be that that huge nugget that we're trying to crack um so um we're in the process now of working with some clients and looking at different types of matchmaking technology um, that, that, that can allow online and in-person attendees um, for hybrid events, kind of like break that fifth wall, if you will, and even look at instead of just in-person people connecting with each other and, and not interacting with virtual, how can we use technology in a way that allows them to start meeting up over topics, pre-event, and then on-site, even continuing the discussion. So I think technology is gonna play a really strong role as we move forward into networking. Um, Christine, the, you know, I'm not sure if you have anything to add to the um, networking opportunities that, that we found, but um, I would also just say on the flip side of what's not working is inside our own shop at GES events, we've had every couple of weeks a standing cocktail hour. Well, it, it was really strong at beginning, but, but now we're finding people are not showing up as much. So you almost have to balance not um, trying to make it work so hard. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's like, how frequent is it? And make sure there's, there's really a reason to show up. Christine, any other points on this? Um I'm afraid that I just dropped off again. I haven't said everything that Jen has just said. So um, <laughs> I'm going to wait for the next question and then I'm going to okay. dive in. And hopefully I've just moved, I've moved laptop, I've moved the house, I've I've you know, got out of Brexit and everything to try and get back on. So let's see how, <laughs> how we go. You shouldn't have left the in the common market, right? Um, I know. Oh, sorry. Uh, what One of the things I heard on our podcast that we did was this brilliant idea about breaking the fifth wall. And you talked a little bit about it. 
And they were talking about how you, 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 you touched on it, interacting with the uh, hybrid audience. And they were talking about the people that we, we were interviewing, about you walk into a room and you see all these iPads on the wall and you actually take a person with you on a journey, which was kind of the most brilliant thing I've heard. And I've been telling everybody I know about that idea because I think it's kind of brilliant. Um, do you think that that is the future of, of networking, connecting these digital worlds and the, and the live worlds? And, and it's hard to do. Yeah. Do you want to, any more comments on that? I just thought it was so brilliant. No, we're just sitting on this, this. This isn't kind of our, our work, but I think just again, you know, picking up on what's going on in our in our overall world. There's a, a big event that is a global event, but run out of um, EMEA as a Portugal web summit. I'm sure you must have heard of it. Oh David. yeah, yeah, web summit. It's going on week. right now. So, yes. um, and they've been, they obviously the, in their name, web summit, they are, they're pretty, um, they're pretty technical kind of guys. So they've been re using their own native app to create interactive moments throughout the content. So you're using your phone actually in, in the room. Obviously this year it's virtual, next year it's gonna be hybrid. So how do, you, how do you use your app to make sure that people aren't just using it for email, but you build it into your content? And we've also heard about people doing, giving away swag. So if you're staying on your phone and you're interacting, the more points you get, you get prizes. So there's ways I think you can harness the technology to your content on the screen and make people kind of use their phone um, to add to the event rather than to distract them because we all know when our phone goes off and the email comes in, we all get distracted. It's a, it's just a kind of a, a part of our modern life. And it's I think the digital nature, yes. And I think the digital nature is coming through, um, you know, who've no, never known a life before a smartphone. So that's anybody born after 2007, I believe, um, they won't know what to do if there isn't an iPhone component in their, in their event. So I think we'll build it into the content from the start is the, is the answer. Are you seeing a lot of intergenerational differences now? Uh, because we are getting the Gen Zs coming to events and the hybrid versus the, I mean, some of the Gen Z people will never have gone to a live event. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, an, it's a very interesting question. And I, and I think from a consumer behavioral insights perspective will be fascinating to see what happens next. I mean, you know, if you really think about it, we're having to, um, help people reconnect through experiential marketing. And, you know, as we all come back in person, I think that sociologists and any of us that kind of follow behavioral insights are, are going to be, you know, uh, writing books, blogs, articles, a treasure trove of human behavior and how, how best to help um, multi-generations connect, how best to bring people together um both in person and virtually but yeah i mean it's going to be fascinating I, I would assume that you guys uh, ges does have behavioral people that are uh, contributing to uh your planning process that it's not just the you know the people in the back room just deciding to create okay. an event but it's it's thought through in so many different levels now because it's so important i just heard uh, i did an interview with somebody on e-gaming and the difference between the the uh, Gen Z and the millennials is that millennials will root for an entire team where the Gen Zs are rooting for an individual, which was so interesting. I'm just wondering how the impact that will have on our business. That is interesting. It's yeah. Fascinating. It's fascinating. It is. Uh, so all of this networking stuff, uh, someone is asking about Zoom fatigue. What mm. are we doing to combat a Zoom fatigue, which we never even thought would be a fatigue? <laughs> yeah. Well, that actually goes to some of what we were talking about with the um, pre-event engagement as well as during the event of looking at what works and what doesn't. So, you know, what we have found is people want to show up for live, you know, real experiences in person. Um, while people will say in surveys that they like the idea of video on demand, what we're finding is that oftentimes they get distracted and they forget about it and they don't go back and watch that. So one of the things is um, shortening the content and um, like we did here today, also adding in polling, trying to get people to interact and be able to answer questions. We've seen um, annual meetings, you know, large user conferences where even if you have, you allow your um, attendees to kind of interact and share gifts and share emotion um, is critical because you 
it's not a great idea to overload tons of slides and make it, well, it might be meaningful content to someone. It might get me, be boring to most. So, um, so yeah, that's critical. Um, we're seeing a lot of questions. There's one on how do you see traditional room blocks being impacted by hybrid meetings post COVID? In-person registration may be significantly reduced as people make different choices and hotels may need to rethink their business models regarding meeting space rentals. It's a technical question, but what is, what is what are your, your thoughts on that? Either I guy. think is it room blocks in terms of accommodation or you mean room blocks in terms of booking venue space out in terms of- Accommodations, it looks like accommodations. Yeah. It looks like they're, they're, they're saying that less people will be going to face-to-face uh, -to -face events, which I don't believe that will be the case once we get beyond this. Um, yeah. What are your thinking thoughts on that? Well, I think we're seeing about, we've got a, a hybrid event we're doing in Dubai in, in January, actually. And um, they are definitely doing the, the small, because, because we're still in the middle of a pandemic and we haven't yet got vaccines, they're still doing the smaller booking of, instead of having 4,000 people, they've got a 100 people and we're then live streaming to 8,000. So I think that's going to be the short term challenge for hotels and managing that and also you know, the rooms, obviously social distancing, the capacity of rooms is massively reduced with social distancing. So um, I, I see that, you know, they're gonna have another six or nine months, aren't they, of kind of having to, to reduce their, their well, re reinvent their models them, themselves. But I think we see people wanting to come back to the big experience and, you know, the, the, the kind of long-term optics on this, I think are good, that we will be looking at people coming back. I think there's massive repressed demand, even amongst, those young people who say they just want to stay at home on social media, there's massive repressed demand for people to get out and socialize again. But I think the, the hotel market is, um, I'm not an expert on the hotel market, but the hotel market obviously has been, hospitality as we know has been um, hit sort of almost almost as hard as events in the same, of, um, in the same way. So I think there is going to be a, a gradual build back for those guys as well. You may not remember the early, the late nineties, early two thousands, when all the technology companies were doing more events than ever. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they were craving that gathering, the craving, the, the idea of getting together. Um, and so um, another question is, are you finding any sectors or industries who are taking virtual events more than others that are, that are, that are adopting to them more than others? So there are people that don't want to do them, or do you think that everybody's doing them and will continue to? I mean, I think one of the things we're seeing is right now, you know, many, many companies are, are finding ways to stay connected with their um, customers, their key audiences. And so they're, they're testing and using virtual events. Um, we're of course seeing a um, little bit more adoption of virtual events in technology companies, but even some of our tech companies that, um, you know, have said that they're going to continue with uh, employees working from home and everything. There's, they're now starting to consider hybrid options in Q3, Q4 of 2021. And we actually just did um, a research study with SEMA. And so those results are gonna be coming out here very soon um, on, on uh, this kind of topic of, you know, likelihood of coming back to in-person or a hybrid model. And so, We'll be sharing that out very soon here um, for those that are interested in it. But, um, you know, again, really do like putting on my so sociology hat, my consumer insights hat. Um, we, we are social creatures. And, and while, while virtual has been very successful in certain types of content and experiences, um, you know, I think that, that we all want to get together in person, even if it's, um, companies doing roadshow tours. So more of a hub and spoke model versus, versus everybody coming into one big city. Um, companies like bringing regionalized experiences to um, audiences out there. You know, it's very interesting you're talking about that, you know, the sociology piece. What is it that we get as humans when we want to meet together? What is the hit? Like it, what's the endorphin hit? What is it like? What? Like I go, I see a lot of people walking into events and they never talk to a soul. So they're feeling terrified in many cases, but our job is to make everyone, I call them collaboration artists. How do we as event organizers connect people to give them that endorphin hit that they want to come back? That's sort of the, the question. Yeah, I mean, this goes to the, the 
prime um, level of what it means to be a human and what it means to bring communities together. And, you know, communities have a very positive effect. Events have a very positive effect on people. It's about building your self-esteem, um, learning, having those surprising moments where you run into someone and even the most introverted, shy type person tends, tends to, you know, find ways to connect and, and learn um, passively, actively, what have you. And I think that it's that sense of belonging, you know, um, and like, like, like we've heard from clients who miss the hall, the hallway interactions the most out of everything else, because it's those surprising moments of um, interacting with others that, um, you know, I think is really, we're going to see events come back with a vengeance. I mean, I don't think that is, you know, hope as a strategy. I think it's just watching how humans interact. And how do you feel about how, you know, one of the things I've talked uh, to designers, event designers, the difference between an interior design and an event design. And event design is meant to transport you and make it so that people have something to talk about because they're having a common experience. How important is the decor and the look and the feel and the branding to the, to the sociology, the networking and the feeling comfortable? How do you guys square that? Well, I think we believe it's absolutely integral. So I think some of the things that we look at outside of our industry, if you look at um, theme parks, if you look at kind of the big retail destinations, that those guys are probably slightly ahead of us in the events world about understanding how, not just how it looks, but, but how they've anticipated behaviors and how people move and, and the fact people turn left rather than right, all, all those kind of things. So I think event industry, and we're doing this all the time, is uh, learning, absorbing, and kind of building that into not just the aesthetic, but understanding that there are subconscious triggers that go on every time somebody walks into a room. As I say, I think retail theme parks understand that because they've been doing it for years. I'm picking up on those experiences. And I think we said at the top of the, well, I was gonna say that, but I think I dropped off, that you know, at the heart of this, whether wherever you're doing it, it's all about that emotional connection in the experience. And I think experience design is come as a kind of a, a, a vocabulary that we all use all the time now, rather than, we don't just talk about kind of designing a 3D visual, we talk about what's the experience and then the whole or the, the feel or the, the look of that goes, goes around that afterwards. So I think lots more to learn, but I think we are as an industry really moving into understanding that more and, and getting up to theme park and retail, our retail partners who have probably been um, 10 or 20 years ahead of us on doing it. But I think it's absolutely crucial. Jan, do you have any uh, from your background? Thoughts on yeah, you know, it's funny. I just saw um, someone mention on there, we are sensory people. Yes, we are. And so that's, that's where the experience design is so critical because, you know, um, the, the entire environment that we're creating needs to be in a way that is promoting the kind of behavior and the experience that the attendees are looking for. And, and, you know, I think when we go into um, creative design and ideation, planning mode with clients, we're looking at um, who are who are your attendees and and really understanding what their wants, needs, interests, pain points, you know, what's top of mind for them. And and as much as we can embrace that and then design to meet that, you know, is the great example. Um, I will sh share something that's very interesting too, is just looking outside the industry at universities and how universities are um, scenario planning for how to bring back freshmen and seniors on campus or the entire undergrad um, classes um, or grad student classes. And so one of the things that they're, they're, they're looking at, and this is a great analogy to content and kind of making trade-offs is perhaps um, they continue with the online huge lecture hall classes um, in a virtual space. So let's let's say you're taking Econ 101. Don't worry about having to come into the huge lecture hall. Take the class, you know, have the professor teach online and then come back together on campus in smaller cohorts where there's that discussion, interaction and learning because that's where humans are learning. You know, that's where we learn the most is with this interaction. And, and let's face it, this environment that we're in serves a purpose, but it doesn't quite allow us that, that unstructured, limitless learning from each other that just happens organically. Yeah, I think it's all planned. Uh, there's a great book out there for people that want to know called Social Physics by Alex Pentland. 
and it's all about how ideas flow. And he talks about even when you the way you set the bar up to to create a sense of commerce or or all these aspects of it. So th that what we do is so important because when ideas flow, serendipity happens. Yeah. And things happen, like what you're saying. He, he always also talks about how when you host a meeting, you host the meeting, then you would tell people to go out and explore and then come back and discuss. And it's much more effective than just sort of sitting in the room and trying to figure it out you know, with the people in the room. So there's all these new dynamics. Someone talked earlier about how do you make when people want to buy something? Because ultimately, you know, the purpose of our events in many cases is to sell either an idea or sell commerce or to create a relationship that, that turns into some sort of a monetary thing at some point. Do you have any thoughts on that on this, uh, in terms of the way you design events or the way you get people to want to uh, have sort of the aspirational uh, sense to want to purchase something? Any well, thoughts? Yeah, well, there's a number of things that, that would work on that, on that front. And I, I agree. I think um, we we are we are very often, as you say, trying to sell. If it's not a product, it's an idea, isn't it? And um, I think it's the art of persuasion. And I I think we believe that events are a marketing channel, which is marketing is trying to sell things, isn't it? So we have to kind of put it back into the kind of the marketing frame set. Um, and I think we've seen everything from you know. I guess I'm going to use a bit of an older example of you know the tech companies using user summits, which are now pretty established. The Adobe summits, the Salesforce, Dreamforce. Um, and they're selling all the time by showing aspirationally a better version of yourself. And I think that's a great example. When people come out of there, we know that all their sales go through the roof. That everybody buys the latest upgrade and it's inspirational and it isn't a hard sell, but people want to come out and they want to be an Adobe expert or a Dreamforce export or whatever it is. So I think those are great examples of where you're selling a kind of vision of, of who they might be professionally. Um, I know those are kind of, um, established products now and we all are very familiar with those kind of user summits but when they first came out it was breathtaking it was an, an unbelievable way of selling i think um, the other key okay. part of it too is just the um the really smart communication efforts pre-event on site and post event to keep reminding people and sharing with them what are the exclusives what are the reasons you know what are the, what are the compelling reasons and, and specific opportunities that they have to experience because certainly on our end we're going we're going to be designing and creating it and getting that message out there to create that fear of missing out is a key component and how far do you go in the message? Is it, is it just aspirational to let people discover more things? Or do you, if you paint the entire picture, like in magazines, when I used to do magazines, you'd send a, a mailing piece and you were supposed to just sell the sizzle and then sell right. the aspiration. Like where, how far does a message go now in terms of these key messages that you're talking about? Is it long-term or is it just sort of wetting the appetite? Well, the cool thing is Christine and I are both marketers at heart. And we understand also the power of building brands. And I think this is the unique secret sauce that we are bringing. You know, okay, not, here we go, ready. Run, we're run. not just <laughs> event designers and producers. We bring that, that business strategy and the marketing strategy to our clients in partnering with them on their communication efforts and seeing where where are those opportunities that we can we can we can keep delivering key messages but also get specific as you get closer to the event of what are the specific opportunities you know driving people to find you know to take time to uh, maybe customize their experience before they arrive. So, so that's the part that if we step into the world of how theme parks do it really well, how hotels, top hotels are doing this as well too, top brands out there um, in retail um, and using technology and devices, you know, even apps to make it easier to navigate through Gatwick Airport. Um, you know, we're starting to like really, really see best practices that that can be applied to hybrid events when we come back in person. And that's the part that's just truly fun, um, you know, to, to, to partner, not just as an event partner, but really a business and a marketing strategy partner. What are the things that you've been thinking about that you have to sort of sell into a client, but you really want to do that you think is going to work, but it's going to be a little out there? Any thoughts on that? And think like, we know kind of what works, but sometimes the client may be a little bit, you may be ahead of them. I Christine, any thoughts? I think, yeah, I'm going to just jump in with um, a, a 
again, I, I'm going a bit technology, but I think um, I think thinking about game, game experiences and um, I am personally not a gamer, but I have children, family, friends who are. And I think that immersive experience of the kind of the first person walking through different worlds and different lands and being totally immersed and believing it and being on there for eight hours at a time and not wanting to come out and, and playing with people around the world. And I think that's something that we could aspire to, to deliver, that, that same immersive quality that you get from avid gamers who go and immerse themselves in a, in a whole world and will spend literally kind of, you know, half of their adult life um, diving around in Fortnite or whatever it is. So I think that's a, an interesting methodology that we could look to try and replicate more. Jen. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that going, going, going to that point there on the gamification, you know, one of the things that we've been working through with some clients is um, if it's not Gen Zs, if it's really, you know, Gen X and maybe boomers who are coming to your event, and might not be as much of the gamers, you know, what types of gaming experiences or interaction experiences, you know, trivia type things or incentives, you know, that's, that's relevant for them. And I think that's the thing that is an interesting puzzle to solve is knowing who your audience is and not everybody is going to be embracing jumping on. So, um, how can you get those that wouldn't qualify themselves as ones to jump on and do any kind of gaming interaction? You know, what is the solution there? And I think that that's what we're um, digging into and kind of studying patterns and seeing um, what are the, uh, you know, um, white collar, you know, business suit, um, type A, very busy people. What are they doing in their free time? Well, it's interesting to see that they're jumping on and doing virtual Peloton challenges. It's interesting to see that they're, you know, do, doing gaming nights um, when they can't get together. So is there something in there that we can then bring back to the hybrid experience? So um, GES is a big international organization and we get the benefit of thoughts from all around the world. Um, how has that been an advantage in being an event producers and event marketers? Because it seems like you get your, your, your understanding. We have now the UK and the US uh, thinking, but you're much bigger than that. Tell us a little bit about the breadth and scope of what you guys do. Jen, do you want to jump in or shall I jump in? I think, um, do you know what? We have, we have offices, as you know, kind of in, in many, many different locations. Um, our, our focus, I guess, is, is US and UK. And a, and a big Middle East kind of proportion. But I think it does give us a window on a kind of slightly broader world. And I think one of the things we've been talking about with some of our clients in the last few weeks is also producing global events, because this is what also the hybrid opportunity gives you, is how you bring the cultural sensitivities of understanding how to manage kind of that cross-cultural thing. And that can be anything as simple as how do you choose a comedian and the kind of the awards giveaway? Because uh, an American um, audience might have a very different response to a, an Asian audience that, that might find things, very, things very, very different, very funny. So I think we just try and collate all those things together. I think at heart, experiences are experiences. So I think human nature kind of trumps all that, but I think it does give us cultural understanding and sensitivity about what plays and what works in different environments. And, um, and obviously we've been able to, from a, just a business point of view, Dubai has been you know, running events. So that's been great. We've been able to encourage our clients that if they want to run events, we can help them do that in places that are opening before perhaps the um, United States of America a bit further behind. So I think it's given us some flexibility from, from that point of view. But I think it is a melting pot of cultural ideas and sensitivities that, that gives us that opportunity to, to bring that to a global audience when a lot of our clients are, are now talking globally. Great. Okay. Jen, any final comments? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, we're in a lucky situation at GES because we're financially strong. We've got an amazing global foundation, and this is allowing us to continue to not just kind of learn what's happening in our backyard, but leverage our global presence and offer up that solution to clients because, you know, companies now, it's not about just one specific country. I mean, many, many of our clients are, you know, reaching people globally now. And with these, you know, transitioning to hybrid, you've got this opportunity to continue to reach people globally and then have people, you know, attend in person. And um, that's really powerful for the event experiences out there. So. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, th I'm going to end with, uh, there's a comment on the, uh, a quote that I love. Someone said that after the Spanish flu, we entered the roaring 20s. So I think definitely think people are going to want to join in community once this is over. And we are praying and hoping that that is the case and very optimistic that our world is going to bring the world closer together. And uh, whether it's virtual, whether it's face-to-face, -face, whatever technique that we have, and that we have, you know, the good news is that we've created these virtual communities out of nothing in just a few months that bring pe more people together than ever. And I know we missed the face-to-face -face experience, but I think that it's all going to come back. So with I that, completely agree. I, you know, I think we can go through history and look at different crises that have occurred, and you start to look at how people reconnect in communities, and and that is what we do. You know, if nothing else, I will die on my sword that we are social creatures. And while while this is working today, maybe not perfectly, but it's working, we will get back in person. So whoever said that, high five completely. High five, everybody. Thank you guys so much. This is one wonderful. Uh, it's great to feel something in our in our Zoom calls. And I think that's part of the battle to bring people's personalities out. You guys have been, have been fantastic. So thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.